Hello, Aperio 2021. This is today's, or this year's, or whatever it is you're watching it during's Elms LN community update. So, uh, it's been a year underground in our basements, everyone. Contributing from home, or wherever. But, uh, there has been a ton of progression made in the Elms LN universe. Um, so I'm happy to be leading this project and it's it's uh, various initiatives. So let's dig into it. So what have we been up to? Uh, we now have weekly uh, calls internal to Penn State, uh, who's doing the bulk of the contribution. Um, these are led by Everly College of Science. Um, if you recall, the leads of this project are from College of Arts and Architecture. So we're starting to delegate these things out to our various con contributors. Um, so this is primarily for internal organization needs, making sure that those needs are met, that people know what they're contributing to, where, um, and that our, our key members internally are, are satisfied. Then we have biweekly open meetings for anyone contributing to any Elms LN uh, related property. Um, Recently, this is focused primarily on the Elms platform itself um, and is led by the Buttercups training uh, group, which which leverages Elms and has been contributing to it extensively for the last seven years. Um, so we're also starting to see a ton of courses using Elms LN um, uh, sister product, which is um, uh, Hacks CMS. So this is kind of a spinoff of the Hacks ecosystem. Um, if we recall, Elms while being this thing for educational purposes, it kind of has this thing that's taking off uh, that's grown out of it uh, called Hacks the Web. So Hacks the Web is still something that's built primarily for Elm. So all of the contributions to, to Hacks, anytime we market or speak about Hacks in this way using this moniker, there's always the Elm's logo kind of assumed beneath. So if you're not familiar with Hacks, Hacks ultimately is a um, W3C standard web component. So web components now ship natively in every evergreen browser. They make up about 92% of all web traffic on the planet uh, would be able to receive a web component without any polyfills. Why that's a big deal is we can ship really high performant JavaScript driven HTML tags to anyone anywhere. Uh, the Hacks the Web moniker coming from the tag Hacks, uh, which stands for Headless Authoring Experience. So Hacks is uh, a new breed of WYSIWYG editor, probably more in the uh, Gutenberg block-based editing universe. If you've ever used anything like Grapes, JS, Gutenberg, Hacks is in that sphere. However, its integration is much more similar to a CK editor or Tiny MCE, something you might be more familiar with in a learning management system context. So. Hacks is able to edit any web component because it's able to talk to design assets, meaning any part of any website is a potential thing that we can make editable uh, for anyone anywhere. So we have lots of integrations we maintain with other platforms, things like Grav, um, Eleven D, which is a recent thing that we added in the last year, uh, Backdrop, WordPress, things like that. And so when you would actually use the editor inside these other platforms, right, you have Drupal in this case, but you've got the block editor mode. Now, the reason we focus our efforts on integrating with platforms like WordPress and Drupal is that brings in these other developer ecosystems that previously were siloed. Elms Learning Network's focus is on NGDLE or next generation digital learning environments. It is one of our fundamental goals to unite the web and make anything a learning platform or a place that people can learn because we don't know what your deployment is. We don't know what the decision tree was that led to you adopting Drupal and your faculty don't either. In fact, that's not something they care about. They care about educating. And so we wanna be able to be wherever they are, meet them in their spaces. And so hacks and the ways in which we're able to integrate hacks is a unique way for us to achieve that. So uh, I mentioned that we're able to talk to anything. So basically there's some JavaScript behind the scenes any web component is ultimately driven by a JavaScript file. That JavaScript file, uh, which would make up in this case, we're seeing a Twitter embed tag. So if you wanted to embed a tweet into a learning platform, because you're having a conversation about something that people were talking about in the social sphere, you can use hacks, drag and drop that in. And what's actually happening is the Twitter hyphen embed tag has this little bit of JSON telling hacks how to edit it. And so we basically map the hacks editor with fields that you can modify to what happens in the DOM or document object model. So that when you enter information into the field, 
type it in, it updates the tweet, and you see it live. That is then platform agnostic. That embed works anywhere. That stuff is just HTML and can be shipped to any platform. It's part of the big deal. So what we're looking at as far as where we've been and where we're going, hacks in 2017 look like this. It was this really clunky thing, the prototype. We were just kind of describing like, this is an idea we have of something we could do. And we think web components are the way to go about it. And then in 2018, we got a lot more components. So we were talking probably about 100 bricks in all. Using those bricks, we can build out user interfaces that are a little bit nicer, but still pretty clunky. We get to 2019, additional refinement. We get to 2020, last year, you know, beginning of last year, where we had an audit by um, the National Archives. We also started to have certain classes in uh, Penn State's IST school contributing to the user experience of hacks. And so we're starting to get this more refined, more robust user experience pattern that works across platforms. To what we will ship soon in 2021, uh, which is the next version of Hacks. Uh, it's very clean, it's translatable. So now it's able to, um, you can actually click settings and translate the whole thing into Spanish rather easily. Um, so on internationalization front, we have the ability to internationalize any of our components now. Um, this is a major lift to do this in a way that's platform agnostic yet performant. So uh, well, we haven't translated all of our you know, Lego pieces, if you want to think of it that way. I mentioned we had 100 in like 20, 2018. Uh, well, we've got like five to 600 now. Um, reusable bricks that work anywhere uh, in any application. It could be other Aperio applications um, for that matter. So we need to be able to internationalize those in a way that ships in this unbundled way uh, where anyone can take pieces of the UI and, oh, you're loading this page and it happens to be in French. Well, this little brick needs to be able to be translated to French. Otherwise, you're not going to use the brick. So uh, we came up with a way of being able to do this. We can actually translate the entire Hacks user interface. Um, I'm going to pull that up for a demonstration right now. If I can get my window over here. Here we go. Okay. So... I'm going to pull up uh, the hacks tag. So this is hacks running just in a local uh, a local development environment. I'll move my face out of the way. Um, so we've got the edit button, and this is going to progressively load some things in. So I'm going to hit edit, and we can jump around, and I can take this text. I can now view it as source and edit the HTML directly, uh, which is a cool inline functionality. Uh, we can also go through. I can modify just a, a list of items. The editor jumps with me. Um, we can maybe insert a paragraph and then collapse that out of the way. We can make this a two column layout. I can take this text, drop it in there, right? So we're creating this platform that allows us to drag and drop, move things around at will. Um, if I wanted to take this self check item there and, you know, speaking of which we have a self check item uh, so that we can do a little inline quizzing. So, we have our structure, media, the editing interface for this so that I can tweak it in context in a platform agnostic way. But I want to change the language. So uh, while this will respect page language and just automatically translate to Spanish if ES is used, uh, if I switch this over, we see that the UI starts to translate itself. So not all of the elements um, are respecting the translation yet. We can see that major parts of the hacks interface, including the Tor, right, but not everything. So we're still working on doing the translation itself. Um, so this is definitely an area uh, for contribution um, to our projects. And, you know, we can see, oh, well, there's the Twitter embed I mentioned before. Right, and we're starting to translate even the parts of the hacks user interface that relate to that. I'm gonna move me down so we can see that. So let me leave that ago. So back to what our efforts were in here. Uh, another effort we're engaged in is the Open Studio. Now, Open Studio is something that we won an award for. I believe it was 2012. It's it was a while ago. Um, we rebuilt it in Web Components in 2017, but that was the last time it's been it's been revised. It's been undergoing um, a total UX teardown, rebuild, uh, rebuild architecturally, rebuild from a UX perspective. This is going to ship fall of 2021 as part of Elms. 
Um, and you kind of have to play with it to see it, but it's effectively a, a visually engaging way for students to submit media to each other, to have conversation and, and community in a social space. If you can imagine when we're all stuck inside, you might be craving social outlets any way you can. So um, we also, as part of the last year, we have webcomponents.psu.edu, which generates a storybook file. And a storybook is a way that you can run through and play and see what all the elements we're referring to are. We have tons of them documented well over here. Um, but so this is the story, the studio running here headlessly just so people can play with it. It's not real data, obviously. Lots of cats. Um, so you can imagine people go through, go, oh, there's this, and we'll leave feedback on it. It can view someone's work as a river of their work. So this is for building out projects more completely, right? So we have the ability to go through, see what the next, the next previous posts are there, view this image, uh, zoom in on it. I can jump between, you know, move the image around if it's a very large image potentially that someone submitted, rotate it if I need to. We can jump between the images in any individual post. And then we can see that there's a conversation that emerges over here. So I can just write, add whatever my feedback is, get it in. This is not a real demo. Obviously, it's all fake data. Um, so we can reply to each other, see what that conversation is, see what the threads are, things like that. Uh, we have the ability to view our assignments in kind of this Kanban board uh, setup. So this is something we currently have, but this is a re-envisioning of that so that it's more usable. Um, and then we have our activity index as well as just the ability to sort through, find just the assignments that we want at any given time. Um, so this is still obviously work in progress. We're going to roll this out uh, in the fall, but it's another one of our big initiatives for the year. So another initiative that complements this is uh, grading, because you need to be able to grade if you're going to have all this student work that's in one place. So we're currently working on uh, a grade book, which is also a web component, if you can imagine. This one's unique in that, again, fitting with the NGDLE mindset, this one is actually currently being prototyped to pull from a Google Sheet. Um, the idea being that a faculty member could fork one of our Google Sheets. That sheet has the criteria by which this interface sets itself up, but it gives them the ability to, say, define their own tags that would then show up as the tagging structure to use in this interactive drag and drop rubric. Um, so that I could add add feedback, give overall feedback. Maybe I go through and I say, oh, you got a 20 out of 20, or I un untether the score here, and that we can see it updated in real time, right? That I'm uh, giving them an A minus. Well, that's based on my grading scale. Here is that grading scale that I've plugged in, but that grading scale is coming from a Google Sheet on demand is, is part, of, part of the idea. So I could skip around through different students, review them rapidly, right, and see that I haven't given anyone any feedback here. Um, we can load up different rubrics based on what the work would be, right? And again, we get that nice reactive, rapid ability to assess and evaluate is what we're going for here. Um, so this is still obviously work in progress, building out what the student view would be, right? So they could see, hey, you got a you know, you got a, a minus because you got a nine out of 10 and that puts you in the 90 to 92% range, taking that feedback and loading it into a format that's much more like a PDF you would print out almost. Um, so that you could do that if you want. Um, we also then have the ability to view the assignment in question, which we're still working. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so that you could skip through the students, right? So we're still working on the UI of this, where it positions elements, how you have access to that information, right? I can pop that open in a new window. This is obviously very much in development actively as reviewing it. However, this is powered by Google Sheets. We'll see these things load in uh, dynamically. So I think there's a lot of power in this. This is going to be integrated into Elms as well in the studio. So it'll be kind of a standalone grading interface that's able to pull the data in from the studio that students have been submitting and provide a, a space for evaluation. Part of the thinking with it being hooked up to Google Sheets is you could dump it out as an Excel sheet. Um, I know I teach classes now for the university. I still, even if it's in you know Sakai, uh, Canvas, Moodle, whatever, I still want that data as a hard copy, like sometimes even, you know, print it out type of a thing uh, so that I have a grade book somewhere else 
uh, for emergency purposes or whether it's for initial evaluation before I then enter the final grades. Um, so we're trying to align more with the way faculty members work. And a lot of times that's outside of our systems that we built. So that's another initiative we have going on. OER Schema has uh, seen some progression in adoption in the last year. It actually recently was published in a book um, about remixing open educational resources by project lead Michael, uh, Michael Collins, who's a faculty member at Penn State. Um, so it's been harmonized more fully with another technology called LMRI. Um, you can read about that. I'll post links to this, to this Google Doc. Um, it's implemented more deeply into our elements over the last year, and it also now shows up in our Hack CMS themes. Um, which I'll show a couple of here in a second. So we have new themes this year. Um, Hackstheweb.org got an overhaul, but this is a hack CMS theme, meaning the theme can be repurposed for other materials. Um, so I actually use this for teaching some of my online courses. But hack CMS is very flexible. It also got rolled out as this by ODL, uh, Eberly College of Science, who does a lot of contributions to the project. Uh, odl.science.psu.edu is a gorgeous website that's been developed using hack CMS rolled out lots of uh, really engaging content. It's very fast and it's powered by the exact same technology and tech stack that's delivering, in this case, their Physics 212 course, which is a OER course generated using hacks and hack CMS for the world to, to consume. Or this Astro course, which has a slightly different theme that we've worked on in the last year, or Chemistry 202, or Biology 110, which has a slightly different theme or my own IST 210, uh, which is another course we taught using hacks.psui.edu, which is a um, SaaS offering internal to the university that we use as a kind of incubation uh, playground area at first, but now a lot of other faculty are starting to, to use this to develop online course materials because it's so fluid to work with. Um, or slightly different theme, this is uh, my 402 course. And, if you said, well, you mentioned that was a different product, it kind of is, um, but at the same time, it's not. So what you're seeing here in this little GIF, because I don't want to go to the actual uh, content at the moment, is taking um, one of our Beatles courses, uh, which is loaded in Elms, right? So Elms, if you're unfamiliar, is powered by uh, Drupal. It's a Drupal 7 based ecosystem. However, what's being demonstrated here is that the data to power the interface, because this is showing a, a hack CMS uh, course presentation, this content is coming from the Elms website. So we're effectively loading Elms content into hack CMS visually. So our users get this really fast, engaging, um, performant, click and jump between content, reorganize it rapidly type of experience that you're seeing here. However, they might have engineered that content in Drupal, air quotes. So we're starting to align these efforts directly where this, this other product is effectively forming a headless front end for Elms uh, so that we can reuse all the pieces and content of Elms and reuse those across any of those other properties. Again, hacking the web itself. Which brings us to a, the last uh, effort that I get to point to, which is my own, uh, which I recently announced is called Project EdTech Joker. So Project EdTech Joker is an open source contribution initiative that I have started to weave into Penn State curriculum. Uh, so uh, it is a 400, it's part of 400 level courses uh, in our information science technology college where I get to teach. Um, so. It is directly impacting Elms and the Hacks ecosystem, our whole ecosystem. Um, effectively, I end up teaching them about concepts of the web. Uh, so let's say we're talking about JavaScript one week. Well, there will be options that involve minor levels of engagement with our tech stack. It's usually things like, well, you're learning about JavaScript. This is the backdrop. However, there's always options that involve direct contribution. So there's a pathway that I've created throughout my web technologies course that if you stay on that pathway for how you submit the labs, and there's 12 labs, you will effectively start doing contributions directly to Elms and the Hacks ecosystem about halfway through the course. So um, I put this in practice this semester, this uh, past semester, we're talking fall, um, or sorry, spring 2021. Um, I had nine students 
uh, in this little infographic at the bottom shows it. Nine students have had 52 commits in the last month, and currently only 20% of the course is contribution driven. Um, also, those nine students are of 33. Students were given the option of a direct contribution track or um, a, 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 different, a different option that didn't involve deep coding. However, this fall of 2021, over 60% of a new course I'm building is going to be direct contribution after 40% is initial onboarding, which means working on documentation. It means making sure that things make sense for our brand new contributors. This course has 42 people enrolled, knowing they're going to be contributing directly to properties uh, that are open source that they can put on a resume and say, hey, look at this thing that I contributed to. They can work on a larger project that has real world impact and they can actively work on fixing issues in their own courses. So as an example, this semester, uh, we do a lesson where we identify UX issues. We talk through how user experience works on a low level, right? And we're talking with a partner, partners documenting what the person's doing, going through a user recitation. We then take those user stories and turn them into issues, which some students a few weeks later turn into commits to resolve those issues. We then pull requests and show the whole thing end to end back into the projects, those projects being our course content, and they actively see that they just resolved UX issues in their own learning resources. This is an unparalleled effort as far as the pipeline between students, faculty, and staff and building the ecosystems we need to actually change and improve online education and education in general, because the course I'm mentioning is in person. So. I am using the moniker Project EdTech Joker for this. We are going to start having a ton of contributors to Elms and the Hacks the Web platforms as a direct result of having a faculty member use the project as a backdrop in order to teach about web technologies, but also improve the projects that we use every day. So the Elms LN roadmap ahead, uh, we've got a fall rollout of Open Studio and the Gradebook tool continuing to grow our community via students, faculty, and staff. Uh, it means a lot of low-hanging fruit onboarding style issues are getting tagged with this Project EdTech Joker uh, tag in our issue queues. And then I'm assigning students uh, things that, you know, are, are not going to drown them as an initial issue, but are like a good starting point, And they kind of work their way through the issue queue from there. We also have other faculty um, that have been moving from Elms to Hack CMS and other ones that are using their course in Elms, but it looks like Hack CMS. There's some workflow reasons for that I won't get into. Um, and so we're gonna have more faculty doing that throughout the year. We've actually started to have faculty from other colleges asking to get in on this um, because it is just a, a SaaS solution. So we're working with them to work through what the UX issues are and what additional things they need. And then Hacks Camp is gonna be virtual at Aperio this year, and it'll be in real life uh, whenever events resume, we're kind of, you know, we had a lot of events that hit pause, obviously, as everybody did. Um, so we will start back up with our in-person events, hopefully by the end of the year, but you know, who knows? <laughs> it might be, might be into next year. Um, we're also redoing our marketing sites and the way that we communicate about the projects. You may have mentioned uh, or may have noticed I'm using the word Elms versus Elms LN or Elms Learning Network. So the overarching project umbrella is the snowflake still, and it's Back behind me, it's uh, Elms LN and Elms or Elms Learning Network is what the LN stands for. However, when we're talking about the actual platform itself that some people use as built on Drupal, starting to call that Elms. Uh, just differentiates between the entire organization's uh, body of work and this singular platform uh, that's rolled out to, to implement it. Um, also, we're going to be continuing our internationalization and accessibility efforts. We actually just rolled out automated accessibility testing across our entire portfolio. Um, that was a, a major student contribution um, in the last week, actually. We put that in. So um, if you're interested in joining the Elms LN community or getting involved with Hacks Camp when it happens during Aperio, uh, you can always go to bit.ly slash hackslack or look me up on uh, at BTO Pro or at Elms LN or at Hacks the Web or hashtag Hacks the Web. Any of those uh, on, on uh, social media would be the way to get involved in the project to learn more about it. So hope you have a great event and we look forward to hacking the web with you soon.